Now we're going to move into the Harlem Renaissance. So from 1919 to 1925, Harlem becomes the center of African-American culture. And this is the sort of thing that communities are always trying to make happen. They try and create art colonies so that artists will all move to some town in Kentucky. Or we put certain things together hoping that certain people will come into a certain place. The Harlem Renaissance is different. This is organic. This just sort of developed. And it primarily develops because we have a lot of African Americans moving north in the industrialization as a result of the industrialization that we see during World War I. Basically, there's a ton of jobs in the north. And so a lot of African Americans will move north into the cities to take these manufacturing jobs that are building tanks and aircraft and other things for World War I. So suddenly we have these communities developing. And what we see here is African American painters, novelists, sculptors, poets, and musicians all in one place at one time, creating this artistic outpouring. Although the Harlem Renaissance is also controversial because it was seen in part as isolationist and by others as simply particularly conventional. They would explore themes such as African folklore and the daily life of the African American community, which in the late 19 teens and early 20s is not a good experience. Of course, this experience is not like it is today. We're pre-civil rights. So they're still dealing with the issues of Reconstruction, which had only ended about uh, 40 years earlier. They're trying to celebrate their history and culture. And we see W.E.B. Du Bois and other intellectuals that will spearhead the movement. So let's talk about a couple of different artists and ideas coming out of this period. First, we have Palmer Hayden. Now, Palmer Hayden is trying to examine African-American life and the role of the African-American in this new society where African-Americans had suddenly moved north and became the backbone of northern industrial manufacturing. So he creates the John Henry series. Now, John Henry is uh, this African-American man who's working on the railroad who will eventually go up against a steam engine trying to build a tunnel faster, showing that he's better equipped for this job than this machine that may replace him. And visually, he's expressing the wealth of African-American oral tradition. Of course, the John Henry stories are all oral tradition being passed down. And again, he's focusing on industrial society's reliance on African-American labor. Basically, at the time, he's saying, look, if the African Americans were to all pull together and disappear tomorrow, then industry will collapse because they're doing all of these jobs that other people don't want. And of course, John Henry will die in the process here as he fights that steam engine uh, trying to dig a tunnel. So what we're really looking at is trying to bring attention to this new role of African Americans within post-World War I society. Then we have Aaron Douglas. Now, Aaron Douglas is exploring the vocabulary of African American myth and culture. And much of his work will be used to illustrate and as cover art for books by other Harlem Renaissance authors, but he also does murals. And he does a collection of murals known as Aspects of Negro Life. And there's actually four murals associated. So we see four separate panels. The first is looking at cultural background, looking at music, dance, and sculpture in the African-American tradition, going back to the original African roots as Aaron Douglas sees it. But then we see the next two panels, which feature slavery and emancipation in the American South. Both of these would seem initially to be quite uplifting. For example, here we see a speaker, we see a city on a hill, that sort of promise of society. We see music 
and dancing. And then on the left, coming in, we see the Ku Klux Klan, uh, easily recognizable by their headwear. And what's happening here is Douglas is reminding people that, yes, we've made these great leaps forward where the African-American experience in the U.S. is not as bad as it was. However, there is still that continuous threat of violence, something that's always nagging at the back of their mind because they know it's always a possibility. As we move on to the third panel, we have a similar idea. So here we have people, uh, again, celebrating, uh, working on the right, celebrating in the middle. We've got music, we've got dancing, and then we have a lynching, uh, which has just happened. And we can see the feet hanging from the tree, the rope uh, presumably holding the body up, and then we have the mourners encircling that tree, telling us that that tree is important, drawing us to that point. Again, speaking to that racial violence that is a constant threat in the early 20th century. The last piece is a little bit more celebratory, although we still have a bit of a haunting image here. So what we see is the, a theme of music, but it's not just music, it's hope for music. But you notice he hasn't found the hope. He hasn't found the fame. So we've got our central character here in the center uh, holding up the saxophone and he's looking out and seeing the Statue of Liberty, uh, which is actually down there. And the Statue of Liberty is always this symbol of great promise and great hope. And he's looking what looks like a canyon is really the big city. So the place you have to go as a musician, but to get there, to become that well-known musician, he has to fight against a lot of other elements. And we have these disturbing images. We have this uh, almost hand-like form. It's a skeletal hand in the form of this almost gaseous uh, element here on the left. We have someone who appears to have fallen and is suffering. We have another shadow hand here that is trying to grab someone who seems to be going up against this gear. And you could imagine this gear actually turning backwards uh, based on this form on how he's trying to desperately walk up it. Basically saying, look, there's a lot to get to this point to find your dreams as an African-American. There are a lot of elements trying to hold us back, which we see in those shadowy, disturbed, uh, skeletal hands. We have that gear working against us, the society working against us. We are, our lot in life seems to be the factories and industry here in the North, but what we want is the freedom to follow our dreams. And that's what you're seeing here in the last panel of Aspects of Negro Life. <laughs> 